How y'all doing today? Let's try that again. How are you doing today? There you go. There you go. Well, great to see you guys. If you have not grabbed communion, I'm going to pray, and then feel free to grab communion in the back. If you have not grabbed it yet, feel free to do that. It is perfectly free. We are not charging for communion. Uh, <laughs> uh, but we just want to be encouraged today. Um, today is the day that the Lord has made. The Bible says, I will what? Rejoice. Rejoice and be glad in it. And that doesn't mean that every single thing in our life is perfect, but we're going to rejoice because we know the one who's on the throne, the one who oversees everything. Amen? So that's a great reason to rejoice. So let's stand and let's pray together. God, we thank you so much. God, we thank you that we can rejoice in you. God, no matter what our week has looked like, whether it's been good, whether it's been bad, whether it's been hard, whether we've seen you throughout it, God, we know that you are there on the throne. God, your love is there. Your love never fails. God, I pray that encourages us. We come here today, God, in, in worship. God, and that word just means we're just showing that you are worth, God, our praise. You're worth us singing. You are worth us bringing up these wonderful truths of who you are, reminding ourselves and sharing out to all the world who you are. So, God, we pray, as your word says, you inhabit the praises of your people. May we see you move in great and powerful ways today as we worship you, as we, we come together, as we seek you out. We thank you for all that you're doing. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Hello, hello. There we go. Hey, good morning, church. How's everybody doing today? Good. Hallelujah. All right, let's go ahead and continue to worship and praise our God today. We're going to pray today, God, that you open the eyes of our hearts, God. We want to see you today, God. We want you to be high and lifted up, God. Let's sing that with one voice. Here we go. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Yeah, let me hear you guys sing it out. Open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you, to see you high, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Yes, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. I sing that again. Open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. So let's sing holy. Holy, holy, holy. Yes, you are, God. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. One more time. Sing holy. One voice, see you high. See you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. 
pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy to you high and lifted up shining in the light of your glory pour out pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy one last time, holy to see you. Yes. Let's look to heaven. Sing that again. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. Hallelujah. Has ever got a hand clap of praise this morning? Yes, God. God, we want to see you this morning. It's your presence, God, that we need, God. Not what you can give us, Lord, but it's your presence, God. So, Lord, we invite you into our hearts this morning. God, we want to come back to the heart of worship during this moment. If there's anything that's, you know, could be distracting you in your mind from worshiping right now, let's lay it at Jesus' feet right now so we can fully engage with him right now. Hallelujah. When the music When the music fades And all is stripped away And I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's of worth That will bless your heart I'll bring you more. I'll bring you more than a song. For a song in itself is not what you have required. You search. You search much deeper within. Through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. Let's think I'm coming back. I'm coming back to the heart of worship Where it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus Yes, it is, God. Hallelujah. God, you are the king of glory right now, Lord. So it's all about you. Let's sing king of endless worth. King of endless worth, no one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. Hallelujah. So I'll bring you more. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper. You search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for the I've made it when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship where it's 
It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. Yes, it is, God. It's all about you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's sing, I'll bring you more than a song. I'll bring you more than a song, more than a song. Yes, God, we bring our worship to you right now, Jesus. I'll bring you more than a song, more than a song. Let's sing that again. I'll bring you more. I'll bring you more than a song, more than a song. Yes, God. I'll bring you more than a song, more than a song. So sing, coming back to the heart of worship. Yes, God. I'm coming back to the heart of worship Where it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm coming back to Heart of worship, where it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. Yeah, it's good. If you believe it's all about him. It's all about you. Sing that again. It's all about you, Jesus. Where it's all about you. Where it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. God, we lift your name on high right now. God, you deserve all the praises, all the glory, all the honor. Right now, this is the next song is an invitation. I invite you all, if you want to, come to the altar and just lay everything down at Jesus' feet. Just talk to him. Spend some time with him right now. Hallelujah. Lord, we bless you, God. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. See, leave behind. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Cause Jesus is calling. 
bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Hallelujah. Oh, come. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Take a moment and just, just worship him right now. Think of what an amazing Savior he is. Yes, God. Oh, what a Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Bow down. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. I'll sing that one more time. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Slip the high, sing that out again. Yeah, sing it out to him. Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen. Yeah. Yes, God, thank you, Lord. Bow down. Bow before him. For he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah. is risen one more time oh what a savior isn't he wonderful sing hallelujah Christ is risen let's bow down before Yes, give him a hand clap of praise this morning, a shout of praise. 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. That is the gospel right there. He is risen. It will be another story if he died and that was it, right? But he is risen. He is our Savior. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So with, with that, we can rise and overcome. Amen? Amen. Through Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's give him some more praise. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And uh, today is baptisms too. So that's another, you know, that's another representation of overcoming and the triumph we have in Jesus. Amen. Amen. So it's an exciting day. Let's say hello to our brothers and sisters and give them a smile. <laughs> Hallelujah. Good morning, Hope Church Midway. Ooh, how are you guys? Can you hear me okay? Check, check, check. It's hard to stop all the love in this room. <laughs> um, I just want to just welcome everybody's here, um, whether you're watching online or whether you're in person. And if it's your first time here joining us at Hope Church Midway, we would ask that you do one thing. Uh, there is a connect card in the seat back in front of you. If you would just be so gracious as to fill that out and drop that off at the give boxes on your way out, that would be wonderful. Um, we also have just a few things. Uh, we do have a couple ways that you can give of your tithes and offerings at Hope Church Midway. We do have our give boxes where you can drop off using the give envelopes or the giving envelopes. Um, but you can also give through our Version event link that's through there as well as the QR code in the seat back in front of you. I'm trying to figure out where the feedback's happening. Doing a little dance. <laughs> Praising the Lord still. We got this, guys. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but let's just bow our heads and let's close our eyes for prayer. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you that we can give you everything because you are Lord of all. You are Lord of all. And I thank you for just the opportunity to praise and worship the God of all creation this morning, that we can do that as a body of believers, Lord God. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would be here with us throughout the entire service, that we would just be able to experience your presence and most importantly, experience your truth and be transformed showing us what we need to work on, showing us something new about you, and for us to experience how much you really love us. Thank you so much, God. I pray that you would be with our offering, that you would bless the giver, that they would be able to give joyfully, and that you would really let us know everywhere that you want those finances to go. We love you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. All right, so we also want to just let our students know that there is no youth today after service because we do have our breaking bread um, that's after service. But even more before that, we're going to be able to celebrate baptism Sunday, as uh, Pastor Jewett said, and just to be able to celebrate with those that have chosen to be baptized, which is an amazing thing. Um, so please join us after service. We're going to be meeting outside um, and setting up some things, but we'll have the baptisms first, which is right by the parsonage, and then afterwards we'll pray for the food, and then we'll have um, some delicious food. Graciela has been so gracious as to be our host for this, um, this breaking bread, which is awesome. And thank you for for everybody who's been contributing to this. Um, 
We also want to just let you guys know that there are opportunities for our prayer team to just pray for the needs that you have. Um, so just keep those coming. We have our prayer request cards and our praise report cards that are in the seat backs in front of you. So you guys can drop those off as you exit. But also you can let us know those prayer requests through the prayer link that's in you version. You can text us. You can call us. Um, we're available because we want to be there as a church body for the highs and the lows of life. That's how we do life as a church family. Um, so please let us know what those are so our prayer team can also pray for those. Um, we also want to just let you guys know to join us for midweek two this coming Wednesday at 7 p.m. And last but not least, we also have prayer in the park that is happening on Mondays that we've been a part of for the past three or four years and just partnering with our community to pray for our community. And so tomorrow we're specifically praying for first responders. And so if you guys would like to partner with us and the community, just join us at Hale Park at 7 p.m. We meet by the flagpole. That's all I got. If you have not gotten communion, feel free to grab it right now. It's okay. You can get up. No one's going to be upset with you or anything else like that. Feel free to grab some if you have not grabbed it already from the back table. I'd love for you to have it. All right, my name is Pastor JJ, um, and just hearing that title, you know, there's some things that you might assume just hearing that name, Pastor. There's some things that people think. You know, you think, well, maybe, hopefully he had some schooling, uh, you know, <laughs> He tries to follow the Bible, not just teach it, you know, try to lead. Maybe he's a good guy. Maybe there's some things that you uh, would assume hearing this, and hopefully all that stuff is true. I did have schooling, uh, but hopefully all that is true. Um, but not everybody would believe that just by hearing that name, pastor. There's some people that have had bad experiences in churches, right? And so when they hear that, they're not going to think necessarily positive things because they might have had some bad experiences. And that's true for anything. When we hear any kind of a, a name, any kind of a, a phrase, there's some stuff that can come into our minds that can make us automatically say, this is what this means. And it could be true, it could not be true. Um, but it's worth checking out to gain people's trust. That's how I see it. You know, because even if someone's gone through a hard time, and maybe they look at me and say, well, you know, I've dealt with pastors before, i dealt with churches before, it's worth it for me to be able to talk to them, to get them to know who I am so they can understand who God is. That's the, the most important thing. And we've been going through a series called the Seven uh, Love Letters, the Love Letters. These are uh, letters to different churches, and if you missed anything, feel free to go online, check it out on YouTube or on Facebook, and feel free to catch up. But these are seven different individual letters that were written to these different cities. And this is times that Jesus was, um, was personally saying, this is what I care. I care too much for you to miss this. And so here, when we're coming to this, I want us to see, before we even get to this love letter, I want us to see one of the greatest talks about love in the Bible, the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, which says, for this is how God loved the world, that he gave his one and only son. So everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's a wonderful phrase. Like I said, this is the most popular scripture in the Bible. Maybe you guys have seen different things, you know, maybe even on football games, something like that. You have to see people that raise John 3, 16 or something. You know, this is a very popular verse. But the hard part on this is that it has that word believes. And again, just as some people can hear pastor and that comes with some stuff, maybe good or bad, sometimes when people see that word believes, sometimes the stuff comes with that good or bad. And when we say that we believe in something, what does that mean? You know, there are kids and, you know, that believed in Santa Claus when they were younger and they got older like, oh, and if anybody, I hurt anybody, I'm sorry. There is no Santa Claus. I apologize. Uh, so you're <laughs> like, what? I was lied to my entire life. Um, you know, and there's sometimes that we say that we believe in something, and then we realize it's not there. I remember uh, uh, one of the times my, my son lost, his, uh, lost a tooth, and people came up and went, oh, are you going to get something from the tooth fairy? And he goes, there is no tooth fairy. What are you talking about? And they're like, oh. And, you know, I have to, I've had conversations with my kids because they used to get in trouble all the time for telling everybody in school there was no Santa Claus. And I'm like, don't do that. It's a, it's a game parents play with their kids, okay? Don't, don't ruin it for them. You know, and that, that's fine for them if they want to do that. But I was very big on telling them, look, this is not a real thing because I want you to know that anytime I'm telling you on something, you can believe it. And I didn't want belief just as, oh, this is a fun little game we play, because I'm also going to tell them to believe in God. And I don't want them thinking, oh, well, this is just a fun thing you do when you're younger. Oh, this is a fun thing that people do. So there's people that will have that mentality and say, well, it's nice that people believe, because it helps them to be a good person. 
you know, that belief is good for them. You know, I've even heard atheists say, you know, I wish I could believe in what you do because I like how, you know, uh, what Jesus says in certain things. And like, what do you mean I, I wish? You can believe. You can look at the evidence of who God is. You can look at these things. You can see it for yourself. But again, a lot of times we look at belief as, yeah, that's something I'm hoping is true. An analogy that a lot of different pastors have used over the years is, is using a chair. And see, this is actually a chair that fits me. That's why I have this. Uh, so it's a good thing. Tobin and me are like, yes. All right. Um, so, you know, the good thing about this is if I say that I believe this chair is strong enough to hold me, if I sit back and I'm like, well, intellectually, I believe that this chair can hold me, you know, and there's a lot of people that come to God that way. Intellectually, I believe that God, that Jesus is God, that, that God is there, that he exists. I intellectually believe that. There's other people that will say, you know what, I've looked and I've examined the different parts of this chair and I've seen that it's been put together well. And, you know, all those different parts of my own personal examination, I believe that this can hold. I believe this can hold. You're like, oh, that's, that's nice that you've looked at all these different angles. That's great. But have you used it? See, real belief is just saying, and I have no problem with people looking and saying, I want to make sure this thing is actually solid. I think that's good. You know, the Bible says you're supposed to count the cost before you follow God. I think that you should say, when I'm following God, I know why I believe. And to ask different questions. That's why we have, once a month, we have Coffee House, where you can ask any question you want anonymously about God, religion, and the church, and we will answer it. Because we don't want people going there and say, yeah, I believe, but not knowing why they believe. That's an important thing to do. I think it's important for people to look back and say, wow, look at all the great things. I think this does stand up. I mean, we sing about God. We sing about the great things about him, how we should believe him. But the essence of belief is actually, I believe. <laughs> you see how easy that is? See, and that's what this is talking about here. And he says, if anyone believes in him, they will not perish but have everlasting life. Everybody who's actually saying, I'm going to trust, I'm going to give my all into this. Because, you know, when I'm sitting down here, I'm hoping this does not break underneath me. Because that would be insanely embarrassing. It would hurt all of your faith right now. And... Uh, <laughs> Like that analogy, God was trying to show something. Anyway, uh, you know, but I mean, it's, it's a big thing to actually say, I believe in something, but it's belief is actually showing by showing that trust. And so when we look at this great verse, and it's a wonderful verse, again, it's about that love that God has, and he so loved the world, and we're like, that is awesome, and I believe that he loved the world so much, I'm going to trust him enough to give him my all. That's what this verse is pointing to. And the important thing for us to look at, when we look at these different seven churches that he was talking about, a lot of these seven churches believed in God, but also were doing all these other things. Yeah, I believe in God, but I really like this other person's teaching as well that isn't following the Bible. I believe in God, but I really like my lifestyle of sin. I believe in God, but I also fill in the blank. And that's what a lot of these other churches did. And God's here saying, it's like, no, no, if you believe in me, settle in that. Make it settled. Because a lot of times what we do we like to call it half-cheek faith. You know, we're on one side and one on the other, right? You know, and uh, we're like, okay, I kind of believe in him, but just in case, if he falls, I'm, I'm sturdy on my, my own, right? How many of you have kind of lived that way at times, right? Yeah, I believe in God, but just in case, I'm going to make sure I'm good. I'm good. I'm going to cover all my bases because if this thing falls, I want to make sure I'm okay. And a lot of times, that's how we live our life. That's not belief. God wants us all in. And this is exactly what he's writing to this church today. This is to a church that's all in. In. And that's why it's a great church to look at. This is a church that's having great belief. Does that mean that they're perfect? No. Does that mean that they never sin? No. But it means it's a church that has faith, that believes. And this is who Jesus is writing to today. If you want to turn to Revelation chapter 3, this will be today. Revelation chapter 3, starting at verse 7, it says this Write this letter to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. This is the message from the one who is holy and true, the one who has the king of David. What he opens, no one can close, and when he closes, no one can open. You might be saying, finally, a church name that I can pronounce. All right, you know, this is a good one. You know, you're like, I'm, I got this one. Yes, and the city of Philadelphia is named after this church. You know, it's not just named after this town in Rome because this is a very small town. In fact, this town was not known to be that big of a thing, anything. The, the biggest thing that this church, that this town was known for, it was the gateway to the Eastern world. It was the last stop as you're going through Rome, as you went into the East. It was the last thing. But it wasn't a big city, and we'll get to why it wasn't a big city in just a bit, because they had some issues uh, that caused it not to be a big city. But it was a city that was there that was just the gateway to the East. 
But it was known, and just as we call the Philadelphia is known for what? The city of? All right, brotherly love. Some of you are like, I don't know. It's East Coast. I don't care. All right. <laughs> All right. It's known as the city of brotherly love. And they get that from the name. So the name is actually comes from a Greek word, which is a type of love that comes from the love that you would have for a brother. That's what actually comes from that name. It's from that Greek word. And this town, when it was founded, was named just for that. The, the founders, like, uh, he cared for his brother so much. And he's like, look, I want to just show you. I'm going to give you this town, and I'm going to call this town Philadelphia to show my love for you. So now you see you all learned something new today. All right. But we're not just here to get information. We're here to get what? Transformation. And that's what God is trying to show through this too. And this is Jesus speaking fully, him speaking fully on this. So what is he saying? Well, again, this is speaking to a very small town, but it's an important town. And I like that about it. Because Jesus, all the other towns that he talked about, and we talked about this on some of the other ones, they were, you know, some of the great trade ones, some of the richest ones, some had this, some of the hardest workers, you know, a town like union workers and all that kind of stuff, had all these other things that were in these other towns. Now he gets to Philadelphia that's small, but God's like, no, I still find you as important. It doesn't matter your size, I still find you important. That's a great thing to see. It's a great thing to see this. So when we look into this, Jesus describes himself here in a certain way at the very beginning, and how Jesus describes himself is crucial, because how we see him is not as more important as how he actually is, right? Because we can have a different view of who God is, but what does Jesus say about himself? Let's look at that. It says that he is holy and true. So Jesus says we can trust him, we can give our all to him because he's holy and true. Holy means unlike anything else. Other people will fail you. If you didn't say amen to that, you have not been around people. <laughs> Other people will fail you. Different systems that are set up will fail you. All these other things will fail you, but God is saying, no, I am different. You can trust me. I know that usually you have to be like this in most things in life because you don't know if you can trust anything. And he understands that most of us are that way. Most of us live in that anxiety of, I don't know if something's going to break, and so I, I kind of trust this, but I'm not sure if I can fully go into it. And God's saying, no, I'm holy, I'm different, you can fully trust me. And that he's true. He's not going to lie to us. When he says that you can fully have that comfort, that he can cast, we can cast our cares upon him, we can put our weight upon him, he's saying you can actually do that, and it's true. You can believe that. So not only do we sit there, but we can sit there relaxed. We can believe and sit in that belief in comfort knowing who God is. We don't have to sit here and be like, okay, maybe the shoe's going to fall. You know what? Maybe he's going to be really mad if I mess up. Maybe he's going to have all this. We don't have to live with that anxiety, no, because of the trueness of who God is. His love is true. We can trust and sit in him in comfort. Isn't that a great thing to know? And so we see this in this belief, and this is exactly what Jesus is telling him. He is holy and true. But again, we can only know this if we experience ourselves. If we experience this ourselves. If I hear from somebody else that God is holy and true, but if I don't experience it, am I truly saying that I believe? If I said that, yes, this, this chair is sturdy, and you're like, oh, that, that sounds great. I heard that from somebody. I'm not going to try because I don't trust it. That's how a lot of people are with Christianity. You know, yeah, I know, I, I've, I've heard that you could trust God. I've heard that he's holy and true. That's great, but I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if it's holy and true for me. See, and Jesus is saying this to him. He's like, look, I'm holy and true for everyone. That's why we started with John 3, 16. It's important for us to know. He died for the whole world so that everyone, and who does everyone include? Everyone. It's not that complicated. Everyone can have that same confidence sitting down and saying, I can stay here relaxed and understanding, giving my all to God, giving him my anxieties and everything else like that, knowing he is in control. We can have that same kind of belief. And so this is what he's saying this. Now I might say, well, Pastor JJ, what's that whole part of he's saying about the keys? The one who has the king of David. What he opens, no one can close. When he closes, no one can open. What does that have to do with anything? Well, if you want to look in your notes, you want to turn your Bible to Isaiah 22. That's an important um, part that is uh, crucial for us to understand this. And throughout this letter, I was talking to Jouette before service, and I said, I thought this was going to be the easiest church to preach about. This is really simple. It's a faithful and believing church. But this is like the church has all this other stuff that scriptures that it's pointing to. So we're going to go on a little bit of a journey today. Is that good? 
And uh, so Jesus wants us to take this journey to understand who he is. So in Isaiah 22, he talks about two different people who are in leadership. So these are people that are right under the king, that are serving the king. Two different individuals. One's named Shebna and the other one's Elikim. So Shebna and Elikim, both working for the king, but Shebna was very arrogant. He thought he was all that. He wanted everybody to pay attention to him. He was building this big tomb to kind of back up his status. And he was treating other people like, hey, look at my, how great I am. He wasn't focusing on the king that he was working for. He was focusing on himself. And so God tells him, I'm going to replace you. You think that you're in this great seat of honor. I'm going to replace you with Eliakim. So Isaiah 22, verse 19 says this. Yes, I will drive you out of office, says the Lord. I'll pull you down from your high position. And then I will call my servant, Eliakim, son of Helikiah, to replace you. I'll dress him in your royal robes and give him your title and your authority. And he will be the father to the people of Jerusalem and Judea. I'll give him the key to the house of David, the highest position in the royal court. So again, he's throwing back to this language there in Revelation 3. He's saying, I'm giving him the key to David. Well, what does that key represent? He answers that himself. When he opens doors, no one will be able to close them. When he closes doors, no one will be able to open them. He will bring great honor to his family name, for I will drive him firmly in place like a nail in the wall. He will give them great responsibility, and he will bring honor to even the lowliest members of his family. Allow me to explain what he's saying here at this very end part. Because this is crucial for us to understand. See, there's a lot of different examples in the Old Testament that help us to understand who Jesus is and why he came. This is one of those. This is one of those examples that he's showing. And he's showing what Jesus is going to do. So, this guy... Uh, this, this first person that's there, this Shebna guy, this guy represents Adam. Adam, the first person who was there to be our representative, to go underneath God and to help to, to look over the world. That was Adam's job. He was to make babies and look over the world. Pretty simple job that he was given, right? And he still messed it up. Why? Because he was arrogant. He was very, very arrogant. He said, hey, I can do whatever I want. I could be my own God. Yes, this, guy, this uh, serpent's talking to Eve, wanting her to eat this, eat this fruit. Let me see what happens. And arrogantly, instead of stopping her as he should have, he just says, oh, let me see what happens. And then after she takes it, oh, nothing happened to her. I should be fine. I'll take it myself. Again, still living in this great arrogance, just like Shimna, having this great arrogance. Look, I can do whatever I want. I am in control. So the Bible then talks about Jesus being the new Adam. The Bible specifically calls him that, the new Adam, the one who replaces that. See, the first Adam brought the curse on the earth, but the new Adam brings salvation. See, Jesus used his authority while Adam just became arrogant. It's important for us to understand that. Jesus uses his authority. How did he use his authority? Well, that's the great part about that second part of that verse. Again, the key is that anyone that, no one, that can open doors and no one can close, and close doors and no one can open, showed his absolute authority that he had. See, Jesus has all power, but what does he do with it? And that's why the interesting part, that last part of that verse, says, for I'll drive him firmly in place like a nail in the wall. You might say, what in the world is he talking about? Well, back in those days, they didn't really use shelves. Shelves weren't really a thing back in those days. What they would do is they would have these pegs. They would put these different pegs out there. And anything that was important that you didn't want to get dirty, you didn't want animals around, you didn't want kids breaking, you would put on these different nails that were in the wall. So you would put these different parts on there and would show, hey, I want to make sure this doesn't get messed up. Everybody with me? And so you would put this nail on the wall and say, this thing is so important, I want to make sure nothing messes with it. And the last part of that verse there in Isaiah 22 says this, then I will give him great responsibility and he will bring honor even to the lowliest members of his family. And actually, that's not the greatest translation there of the Hebrew. The, greatest tra the, the better translation to that is I will hang on him all the glory of his father's house, even the lowliest things. So he says other things that people don't think are that important, that they wouldn't take the time to put it on this hook, to go into there and drive it into the wall. They wouldn't go to all these different steps. Even those things, I'm going to put on there because it's well worth it. So what does Jesus do with his authority? He has all this great authority to, un to open doors that no one can shut, to shut doors that no one can open. He has all this great authority and power. And what does he do with it? What does he do with it? He saves us. I mean, think about it. We are just like Adam. We sin in arrogance, wanting to be our own gods, right? Anybody ever sinned in arrogance, wanting to be your own god? Okay, those who are following me, the rest of you guys are lying. That's what sin is. See, all sin means is missing the mark. This is the way that God wants me to go. 
I want to go this direction. We've all done that, right? And that's just saying, I want to call my own shots. I want to be my own God. I want to be my own Lord. Yes, this is where he wants me to go. I want to go this way. And arrogantly, we think, hey, yeah, this is what God says is best. But really, I see this as best. And it's arrogant to think that we're more knowledgeable and have more power than God has. That's just an arrogant place, just like Adam. But the one who is holy and true, that God didn't use his authority for himself, but it was nailed to the cross so our sins can be nailed. That's the interesting part about this part in Isaiah. When we think, and this is why we're going to be celebrating communion, and I do mean celebrating at the end. When those nails that were in there that nailed him to the cross, that was just like he was saying to like him, when he's saying, look, I'm going to put on you, even the lowliest of things, you're going to lift them up in honor. A lot of times when we think about Jesus on the cross, we feel so bad, and we're like, oh, my sins aren't worth it. But you know what? Jesus says, you are worth it. You are worth him dying for. That's important for us to understand. So he's saying, yeah, I'm going to be lifting you up. I'm going to be lifting you up. All those different sins, all the different parts that you have, that's lifted up on me. I'm taking that for you. That's that great love that Jesus has. So when he says to trust him, he's saying, you could trust me because I'm showing you could trust me by giving my all, by giving my life for you. It's important for us to say, do I want to believe in the one who believes in me? Do I want to say, I really believe in that one who believes in me? The one who would go to the cross and say, I will take all of your sin, your shame, and everything else on the cross. I'll do that for you so you can live. Do you want to believe in the one who believes in us? And this is who Jesus is calling himself, the one who believes in us. We think about it, we will fall. I mean, let's reverse this. We believe in Jesus. We're like, yes, he's sturdy, he's holy, he's true. And Jesus is saying, I believe in you. And you're like, that's not a good thing because I will break. Right? We will break down. We will fail. We will fall. These are things that are going to happen. We're going to let God down, Right? You ain't saying yes. Come on, people. Come on. All right. We will do that. You're like, never. I have never sinned in my entire life. All right, come on, people. We're going we're gonna to fall. We're going to let him down. But still, he chooses to believe in us. That's amazing to me. You want to say, God, after, after falling on the ground all these times of leaning on me, aren't you done with that? Aren't you tired of that? Anybody ever felt that way? You know, I continue to do this over and over again, and this continues to break. God, why are you still doing this? Why are you still having this faith? He says, yeah, I have faith in you, and I allowed these nails to go on there because even though you felt lowly, I still wanted to lift you up. I still care about you. I still believe in you. And I'm going to help you to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And no matter how many times you break, my mercies are new every day. I'll rebuild you. That's the beauty of who God is. The one who believes in you when he shouldn't, when he has no reason, he has that kind of care. But yet we look and say, yeah, I believe, but I'm good. So God's saying, I want you to fully show that you believe by trusting, by experiencing it for yourself. Let's go back to in Philadelphia, Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. It says this, I know all the things that you do, and I've opened a door for you that no one can close. You have a little strength. You obeyed my word and did not deny me. Literally in this next chapter, in chapter 4, it actually talks about what that door is. It's a door to heaven. It's saying, I am opening heaven for you. You believed in me. Guess what? You gained heaven. That is like the easiest thing ever, right? You know, that's the most insane thing. Okay, God, I'm trusting you. I'm giving you my all. I'm giving you my anxieties and everything. He's like, great, I'm giving you eternity. We won that deal. All right, that is the greatest change you ever had, you know? That is the greatest thing ever for us to say, hey, I'm giving, you, I'm giving you my life. And he's like, yeah, and I'm giving you eternity. It's the greatest thing ever. It's amazing to see this. Now, this church here in Philadelphia, yes, they had some hard times, but they didn't deny Jesus. They didn't deny because they believed. You might be here, and you might be like Philadelphia. I have a little bit of strength left. You might feel like a Philadelphia today. I have a little bit of strength. I have so many things that I'm going up against. I have so many other things that are just opposing me right now, and I'm having all this weight upon me. And what does God say? Yeah, but you can give all that weight to a strong God. You don't have to take all that on your own. It's like, yeah, you have a little strength, but you're not denying me. You're still staying firm in that belief, and you're giving that weight over to me because you were never meant to carry that weight on your own. None of us. We're meant to carry that weight on our own. 
but we can give it over to the one who is faithful and true and wants to help to guide us, to strengthen us as we continue to move. See, when the weight came, this church, they obeyed God's word and trusted he wouldn't let them fall. And he didn't. He found the security in him. You might say, but what type of weight is Philadelphia dealing with? Revelation 3, verse 9 says this. Look, I will force those who belong to Satan's synagogues, who's, who are liars, who say they are Jews but are not, to come down and bow at your feet. They will acknowledge that you are the ones that I love. A lot of stuff to unpack here. What is he talking about? He's saying these people who say that they are Jews, but they are not. They were ethnically Jewish. They were not believing in God. And they were going to the Roman soldiers and saying, hey, uh, they think Jesus is Lord, not Caesar, so you should get them. This is the weight they were under. That's a lot of weight, right? It's more than a lot of us have to deal with in saying, hey, the government can come in and take literally everything. People worry the government can take everything. They did take everything. This is a different weight than any of us have ever dealt with in our lives. Now, there's other people in this world that definitely deal with this kind of weight, for sure. Many different underground churches in different places where they will easily kill Christians deal with this kind of weight. But this is the same place, and they say, look, we only have a little bit of strength. And he says, yeah, and I understand why you need to believe, why you need to give me that weight that you're carrying. And trust me, the little strength that you have is enough with me. I understand what you're going through. But it's also important that Jesus is saying something very specific to the Jewish people that are there. Saying, yes, I have you to understand, your, ethnic, your ethnicity is not enough. Your ethnicity is not enough. It's about belief. It's an important uh, set of verses to help us understand this. Romans 11. If you want to turn to Romans chapter 11, it'll be on the screen as well. But definitely put this in your notes. You want to look at this later, please. Romans 11 verse 17 talks about this. But some of these branches from Abraham's tree, some of the people of Israel, have been broken off. And you Gentiles, who are branches from a wild olive tree, have been grafted in. So now you also receive the blessing God has promised Abraham and his children, sharing in the rich nourishment from the root of God's special olive tree. But you must not brag about being grafted to replace the branches that were broken off. You are just a branch, not a root. You might say, what in the world is grafting? Because maybe you're not a farmer. I had to look into that because I live in the city. I had no idea what grafting is. And I looked and saw a lot of different YouTube videos. And it's interesting. I could do it. I don't want to. But I could. And so basically what they do is they'll take a healthy top of a plant, a very fruitful part of a plant. They'll cut that. And they'll take a root of a healthy plant that might not be as strong or as fruitful as it could be. They will cut off that top part. They'll put the other part in. They'll make a wound. Actually, literally, will cut it into there. And then they will cut the other part, make it match, wrap it up so it's protected, and then now it will grow together. It's absolutely incredible. You want to look something and waste some time on YouTube? It's fun. Um, You know, you can see for yourself. But it's really an interesting thing that they have this grafting element where you've seen this growth that happens. You might say, what in the world is the point of grafting in the first place? Taking this healthy root and a healthy branch and putting it together, what they find is they get more of a yield. If it's a fruit tree, they get more fruit than they ever had. If it's vegetables, they get more vegetables than they ever had. And it's protection that they normally have of those plants by themselves. It is a stronger plant than it ever was by itself. So what Jesus is saying is saying, look, I set up the nation of Israel to be the missionaries to the world. They didn't do that. They didn't do it. That's why Jesus set up. If you ever wondered why Israel was set up as the chosen people, they were set into a place in the middle of every single trade route at the known world to be able to reach out to be missionaries to the entire world. That's why they were set up where they were. But they stayed insulated and said, I'm good with my own thing. And instead of actually reaching out to others, they let the culture reach over them. Instead of them saying, I believe in God, and saying, okay, this is the firm, the one who's holy and true, they said, hey, I like those other gods over there. That sounds fun. And even though they kept falling and falling and falling for these different stupid gods, they kept at them. Why? Because those gods let them do all the sin that they wanted to do. They said, look, I know I'm going to miss the mark, but this God lets me do the things I want to do. So I'm going to follow that. And yes, it's going to fail me. Yes, it's going to be problems. But you know what? I can still do what I want to do. Again, arrogantly acting like Adam. It still allows me to do what I want to do. That's what they were constantly doing. And so God just said, look, I got to have other people help to reach the world because I care for everyone. Again, he loved the whole world. So he says, okay, you're gone. The Gentiles are now in. That's what he's saying in Romans. He says, now they're to be the missionaries to the world. Now we have to do the same thing. We have to learn from what 
for what Israel didn't do. We have to say, I don't want to do what they didn't do. You know, I, I want to learn from that. I want to actually hold on to that belief. I want to be the influencer, not the one who is influenced. I want to be able to help out and to be able to reach out to the rest of them because guess what? Now you are the missionaries to the world. That's your job and my job. We are now missionaries to the world. We're not to be insulated and just say, I'm going to let culture take over me. We're supposed to be influencing everything. That's what God has set up for us. He continues on this. Verse 19. Well, you may say, those branches were broken off to make room for me. Very arrogant, isn't that? All right, well, forget Israel. I got put in. Very arrogant. Yes, but remember, those branches were broken off because they didn't believe in Christ. And you were there because you do believe. So don't think so highly of yourself, but fear what could happen. For if God did not spare the original branches, he won't spare you either. Notice how God is both kind and severe. He is severe towards those who disobeyed, but kind if you continue to trust in his kindness. But if you stop trusting, you also will be cut off. So those people were cut off because they didn't believe. They had the intellectual understanding. They had the entire Old Testament memorized. They looked at every single part and said, that's great. I'm not going to stay firmly in who God is. I'm going to go after these other gods. These other people that were Gentiles, they came in, they heard the great news of who God is, the good news that Jesus came, died, and rose so we can come have a relationship with God, die from our sin and our shame, and rise up as a new person. They heard that news and said, this is great. I believe in this. Bam, they're grafted in. Now they're the new missionaries. They're the new ones to share out in the world. They said, don't be so arrogant and be like, oh, hey, I'm great because of my belief. It's like, no, you're only there because of God. I mean, am I going to sit and say, hey, I can just relax right now and just sit down because I'm such a great person. No, I'm, I could do that because I'm on a chair. The chair helps me do that. Without the chair, I could do this for too long. My legs are going to get tired. It's just reality. It's going to look weird. I'm not going to do it too long because someone's going to take a picture. So I'm not going to do it, you know? And so that's just a reality. That's not going to work well. But if we arrogantly forget the chair is actually helping us rest and we arrogantly forget the reason we have all we have is because of God, we're going to realize Man, this is hard, and we're going to realize we have nothing underneath us. It's fake, and we were cut off and didn't even know. We thought we believed, but we didn't. We were fooling ourselves. It's important to see the moment that we stop believing, we can be cut off. It's a crazy verse. It's a crazy verse to look at. Verse 23 says this, And if the people of Israel turn from their unbelief, they will be grafted in again. It's important. For God has the power to graft them back into the tree. You by nature were a branch cut from a wild olive tree. So if God was willing to do something contrary to nature by grafting you into his cultivated tree, he would be far more eager to graft in the original branches back into the tree where they belong. I love this verse because Jesus does not give up on unbelievers. I love that. Saying, look, they didn't believe in me. They had all the intellectual understanding. They had all this stuff, but they didn't sit down. And even though they walked away, they chose to walk away and not trust in me, I still have a spot for them. That child that you've been praying for that's not following God anymore, God still has a place for them. That family member, that friend, that coworker that might have gone to church when they were a kid, maybe had a horrible experience. Like I said, the name pastor doesn't sit well in everybody's minds. Church doesn't sit well on people because a lot of times they've heard different things. They might have had different experiences that cause them to say, I'm not willing to trust to sit down. God still has room for them. He's always willing to make room. And I love that about this verse. And so it's important for us to understand. He's saying, hey, that that place there with the Jewish people that are calling you in, guess what? I still can trust in them. They still have an opportunity. But he's allowing Jesus to see that these Jewish people in Philadelphia, their issue was that they claimed to be Jewish because of birth, not belief. This is such a simple thing for us to do. And I've seen this so many times, I can't tell you. The phrase I hear more than anything around the neighborhood when we talk about God, yeah, I've been, I've been following God since I can remember. I've been following God since birth. I'm like, really? You were born and you gave your whole life to the Lord. That's amazing. I don't know you can intellectually do that. Well, yeah, I've been following God forever. Really, there's never been a time in your life you never followed God. Because then you, I don't think you even made the decision to follow him if you're saying you've always followed him. Why do I say that? It's because the Bible says you have to deny yourself and follow him. You have to take up your cross and follow him. There's a decision you have to make. You have to say, I'm making him Lord of my life, not me being Lord of my life. I have to say, I truly believe in who he is and give my all to him. If I'm willing to do that, then I'm following him. Outside of that, we're not. 
We're not. That's just the simple and honest truth. We're not following him if we're actually not there in the belief. We're not there. And it's not enough to do exactly what the Jewish people were doing. Hey, yeah, my my mom believes. My mom has a chair. She's sitting down. Great for your mom. That's awesome. I'm sure she's praying for you, but are you sitting down? Are you believing? Because that's what they were doing. They're saying, well, our ancestors, absolutely, they believed. They walked with God. They saw the miracles. So all these other things, they were so great. All of our ancestors did all these amazing things to help us out. And yes, they prayed for them. They helped them so many different times of praying for them through. But guess what? God has children. He doesn't have grandchildren. I'm sorry. You have to be the one to make that decision. And the people that were there, he says, yeah, they're not Jews at all. Ethnically, they're Jewish, but they're not there in belief. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, yeah, we're, we're a Christian family. Have you made that decision? I'm not asking about your family. Have you made that decision? You have to make that decision. It's not the family that makes a decision. You have to make that decision. And if we don't make that decision personally, we're not having that belief. We're not even grafted in. We're sitting outside saying, wow, that plant is growing. That's so great what God is doing. Not realizing we're not even a part. That God's wanting them to be a part again. God still gives them opportunities to be grafted in. I love that he won't give up on unbelievers. It's important for us to understand. As we look in here, how does Jesus help this believing and faithful church here in Philadelphia? Revelation 3.10 says this. Because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I'll protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one can take away your crown. And I might say, what is this, uh, this time of testing? There's many different debates on exactly what's being talked about here. Uh, the Greek here that's being used can be showed as test or can be showed as trial. It, it works for, for both of them. So there's two major events in the Bible that this could be pointing to. One of them is the Great Tribulation. If you're curious about that, come on Wednesday. We're talking all about it right now. Feel free. But that's basically a time where God is going to have the hardest time this planet has ever seen. As far as famine... War, pestilence, you name it. World events, demonic attacks, the worst this world has ever seen. It's also the time of the greatest revival because people will get outside of themselves and say, I need to rely on God. I've been so arrogant. I need to actually rely on the second Adam and not be like the first Adam. So it's the greatest revival that's ever been seen too. So some people are saying, well, this is showing they're being uh, saved from the great tribulation. The other part is that they say they might be showing of what's called the white throne judgment. The white throne judgment is one of the most sobering parts in the Bible you'll ever read. In the white throne judgment, all the different people that come around that have not been already brought up together with God, that have already been the believers, will come right before the throne. Every single person that is still left alive, that every single person has been in existence will be coming in there, and he will have this great white throne. We'll open up the book of life. In there, if he sees the name, those people are good. If he doesn't see their name, they're cast into the lake of fire. Again, one of the most sobering parts of the Bible. But he's saying, look, if you actually believe, if you're putting your faith in me, you don't have to worry about that day. That's not a day you have to worry about. It's not a day you have to stress about. You don't have to worry and say, well, is, is my name in there? No, if you're saying, look, I'm trusting in you. If I'm giving you my all, you don't have to worry about that day at all. Now, that does mean that we can't do the half-cheek faith. We can't be looking and saying, okay, I'm kind of following him. We got to be all in. We got to be all in. Does that mean we're never going to make a mistake? I don't know any believer who's not made a mistake. I've had times where I've been arrogant. I've been wanting to do my own thing, knowing what God wants me to do, and I've done other things, and I'm sure you all have done the same, right? Doesn't mean you won't ever make a mistake again. But it means we don't have to worry. We're secure. And Jesus does such a great job of, of, of elevating this even more and talk about this even more. It's important for us to understand as we persevere in our belief, Jesus protects us. Yes, we might get into battles. That's true. But we're not going to fall and he's not going to fail. We can know that for sure. Whether it be through tribulation, whether it be through trial, God will not fail. We will not fall. We can hold firm on him. And we know this because of what Jesus says next. Revelation 3.12. All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God, and they will never have to leave it. And I'll write on them the name of my God, and they will be citizens in the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, when it comes down from heaven 
from my God. And I'll also write on them my new name. A whole lot in here. Allow me to help you out with this. The reason Philadelphia was not a big city, and even though it was a gateway to the east, is because of the earthquakes that happened there. Earthquakes were constant there, over and over again. So you can't build a big city if it's all going to fall, right? It's like California hasn't figured that out yet. You know, but they, you know, they didn't have all that same kind of technology where they could deal with the earthquakes. They had things that were made out of pillars. And guess what? If it, you're having a, a shift in the foundation, those pillars aren't going to help you out much. They're going to shift, and the, found, and the whole entire thing is going to fall. But here, Jesus is saying, I'm going to make you pillars in the temple of, of the Lord. You got the people in Philadelphia like, pillars aren't a good thing. P- pillars aren't great, all right? Pillars are going, to, are going to crash down. When everything comes down, it's going to crash down. But he's like, no, no, no. You have little strength. You can't hold up when the earth shakes. But guess what? I am your strength. I will hold up. I am the one who's holy and true. See, it's important what he's allowing them to understand. See, the pillars in the temple, there were two major pillars that were known in the temple when it was built. And they were called two different names. One of them was Jockey, and the other one was Boaz. There's these two temples, and they actually named them. They had a name that they were given, which was not done in the rest of the temple. They didn't name all those different parts, you know, specifically. They were named the gates, but they wouldn't name parts of the temple. But they had these two pillars that were named there specifically. And the name Jockey means he will establish. The name Boaz means in him is strength. So as Duet comes up, what does that mean for us today? God brings stability and strength when the world around us is shaken. We live in a world that is shaking constantly, that different things that are happening all around us, different parts that are happening. We can look in the news very easily and see the world shaking around us and seeing this, but God brings stability and strength to a shaken world. He's telling this church in Philadelphia, I know that you think that you're so small and you can't grow because of everything that you're dealing with, but allow me to strengthen you. Allow me to show you the pillars that I'm making you. And I'm going to establish you. That I'm going to be your strength. That you can trust me. You can put your weight upon me. This belief isn't something where you have to be on one side saying it could fall because everything could shake. But we can have full trust and who God is, even the most shaken of worlds. We know we can have the stability and strength that's found for him. It's important for us to understand belief is so much more than just mental. It isn't just something, okay, this is something I'm thinking about. Like we said, we believe in not just information, but for transformation, and belief will transform your life. You're going to have all the stresses and everything else like that that you're going to have, and you're going to say, God, I'm giving this over to you. Not that I'm going to forget about it, but God, I'm going to pray knowing that you are on charge. God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to follow you. Because the interesting thing is this chair also represents is exactly the chair that we have when we start to follow Jesus. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, you will be saved. But for him to be Lord means this chair, this is the passenger seat. It's not the driver's seat. I'm trusting God will not fail. I'm trusting him to guide me. I'm trusting myself to allow myself to be guided by him for me not to grab the wheel. Because I know there's different people who have driven with me and I'd say, I don't want to drive with him again. I get that. <laughs> I understand. Because they kind of freak out a little bit. Jen, like, like, if she ever sits in the back of the car, she's always like, I'll get so seasick because I like, go like that in traffic. I get it. But with Jesus, you can just say, hey, I'm trusting. No matter where you're going, no matter how you're going, I'm trusting. And the beautiful thing is he doesn't want us to trust and hold on and clean on and say, no, I don't know where we're going. He says he wants to give us joy in the journey. That's an incredible thing. How do we get joy? It doesn't mean all great things are going to happen all the time. That's happiness. That's not joy. Joy is when it goes beyond circumstances. And say, look, we're in the bumpiest of roads. I think we're right by the edge of this cliff. I might be freaking out a little bit, but I know who's driving. I know who's in control. I was telling some people that there was a, a mountain road uh, on, this, on this area that I grew up with. I know mountains are big things. I know we don't understand that here. Um, <laughs> there I grew up in was surrounded by mountains. And we had this one mountain called Mount Lemon. And it had this winding road that went all the way around it. And we would drive up, and my dad loves to speed. 
It's, it's his thing. That's where I get it from. And uh, I'm blaming him. And, uh, <laughs> and he loves the speed. He would be driving around that thing like crazy. I remember we were on a motorcycle once. I mean, he's like, like getting near where the motorcycle was even going on the edge because he just loved that because he learned how to drive in Venezuela and stuff like that. So he loved those kinds of roads. That was just the, what he was used to. It's like, oh, this is so great. And we get right up by the edge. But you know what I was doing? I'm like, yeah, this is the greatest thing ever. And I tell people, I'm like, yeah, back in those days, they didn't have guardrails on those roads. It was insane. And, and whenever I tell people that, they're like, what are they thinking? That is the craziest thing ever. Like, that is insane. I'm like, yeah, yeah, but it was, it was the most fun I ever had. Why? Because I trusted the person driving. I trusted him. It wasn't safety rails. It wasn't anything else like that. But I trusted the one who was in control because I knew what he was doing. We should have that same feeling. Everybody around us can say, how can you, there's no guardrails in your life. You're going right towards cliffs. What's going on? Aren't you stressed out like everybody else? Say, no, no, I, I know who's driving. I'm good. How many of you guys need that kind of faith today? God, I'm good. I'm willing to give you everything. You might have a little bit of strength, but guess what? That little bit is enough. So we're getting ready to close today. How's your faith here? How's your faith today? Is your faith just in yourself? Are you just holding, trying not to fall? Is your faith in other people? Unfortunately, they will let you down at times. Is our faith just in religion? Yeah, my mom's sitting there. But are you believing? There's a difference. Or is our faith actually in God? Again, Romans 10, 9. If you confess your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, I'm truly willing to give myself all the way there. Because if you believe, you'll trust Jesus to be your Lord. That you'll take the wheel knowing that you are stable. The Bible says before we take the communion, we're supposed to examine our hearts. When the Bible talks about our hearts, it's our will, our mind, and our emotions. We have to say, where am I at today? An honest look into our lives today. And we're going to start with two different questions. First one is, do you believe? Have you confessed him as Lord and say, yes, I'm willing not just to hear about you, not just to know about you, but to give you my all, to give you everything. With every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're in that first group and you're saying, I believe in God, but I have not made that decision. I've not made that decision to confess him as my Lord. I'm in that driver's seat. I've not trusted him to guide this whole path in my life. But today, I want to be like the church in Philadelphia. I want to give him my all. I want to give him that driver's seat. I want to sit there safe and secure no matter what the roads look like to have that joy in that journey knowing who's in control. If that's you with every head bowed and every eye closed, you want to make that decision today. Maybe it's the first time or maybe you've walked away. Jesus doesn't give up on people who are unbelievers. He's saying this is a great day to come back. He's always willing to graft you back in. So you're saying this for the first time or you're saying, I want to come back to that belief. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I want you just to raise your hand. We want to pray for you today. Amen. God, we thank you. We thank you that you do not give up on anyone. That your love is so great. It's not just something we talk about, not just something we intellectualize, but something that we can live with, we can follow, we can give you our all. And we thank you for that today. I pray right now, God, as we're confessing with our mouth that you are Lord, giving you the driver's seat. God, that we'll do it with confidence. You are the Alpha, the Omega, as the Bible says, you are the beginning and the end. You know which ways we should be traveling. So God, we give you our all as we confess you as Lord. God, allow us to sit comfortably in that belief, knowing that you raised from the dead. As Duet said, it's different because you raised. 
We were just following some guy who had some great teaching back in the day who's dead and gone. That's like every other religion out there. But the difference is you raised. We can sit secure in you. And we thank you for that. In Jesus Christ's name. With every head bowed, continuous. This prayer is for others that are here. Those of you who might be sitting there, again, that half-cheek faith, just kind of on there and kind of on the off, just not knowing if he's going to fail you or not. You're saying, yes, I believe in him, but I'm trying to stabilize myself as well. The phrase I've heard a lot is, I'm working on me. We can't work on ourselves because we can only do what we know. We ask God to work on us. You need to say, I'm willing to be secure, and God, let you work on me. Let you guide me. Let you help me. If you're needing that assurance today, I'm not going to be looking around just between you and God and saying, God, I know I've been half in, half out. I want to be full in. Just raise your hand. I'm not looking. Nobody else is looking. It's between you and God. God, I want to be all in. I want to be all in. Also, for those of you that are here, you're saying, I'm, I'm sitting down in that belief, but I feel like Philadelphia. I just have little strength left. Jesus wrote this love letter to strengthen them even more, to show them that he is their strength. If you're here today, you're saying, I just need to cast all my cares in him, all my weight, all my anxieties. I need to find the joy in following him. Yes, I know there's no guardrails. Yes, I know the area that I'm going towards seems crazy, but I need to enjoy this journey by having full trust in him. God, help me to have full trust in you. If that's you, again, I'm not going to look. Nobody else is looking. Just raise your hand saying, God, just increase my faith. I love as a man in the Bible says, I believe, but help my unbelief. Help these different areas that I've not been giving fully over to you. God, help me to enjoy this journey with you. God, we thank you right now as we're examining our hearts, our, our minds, our wills, and our emotions before we take a communion. God, help us to fully believe, to fully give everything over to you, the stress, the anxieties, the times that we feel that we're still just trying to set ourselves up just because we've been let down so many times. So we're still trying to help ourselves up. God, allow us to know that we can go all in, give our all to you. Because God, you will never let us fall. You will never fail us. I pray that we would find joy in this journey, no matter how it looks, no matter what area it seems that we're going in right now. You will know the one who's in control. God, allow us to come away different today, just as the church in Philadelphia did, being encouraged by this, knowing that the ones that were mocking them could still be grafted back in, but that by their faith, they would see the difference, and they would come to worship you, to bow down to worship you. I pray that we be encouraged as people see us going through the hard roads that they're going down to, but they see our faith in you. They will come back, be grafted back in themselves and worship you. Thank you so much in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So we stand today. I say, Pastor JJ, uh, you forgot there's a little part of that verse that you totally forgot to talk about. Well, this is part, my personally favorite part, the last part of that promise that Jesus is making to them. As he says this, all those who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God, and they will never have to leave it. I'll write on them the name of my God, and they will be citizens in the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from my God, and they will, I will also write on them my new name. So the great thing is Jerusalem in the, in the Bible is a word of saying believers, those who have faith in God, that have given their all to God. I want to encourage you as we're about to take communion. I want us to think about this as we're preparing to take communion. Isaiah 62, 1 says this. And again, when he says Zion, when he says Jerusalem, he's talking about believers. Because I love Zion, I will not keep still. Because my heart yearns for Jerusalem, I cannot remain silent. I will not stop praying for her until the righteousness shines like the dawn and her salvation blazes like a burning torch. The nations will see your righteousness. World leaders will be blinded by your glory. How many of you are so glad that God continues to pray for you? 
saying, look, I know that you're struggling. I know that you're not perfect, but I'm still going to pray for you, and you're going to get greater and greater and greater. How great is that? God's continuing to pray for us, but it doesn't stop there. It gets even better. And you'll be given a new name by the Lord's own mouth. The Lord will hold you in his hand for all to see, a splendid crown in the hand of God. Never again will you be called the forsaken city, the desolate land, the land. Your new name will be the city of God's delight, the bride of God. The Lord delights in you and will claim you as his bride. As we believe in him, we start to see ourselves as he sees us. He believes in us. The church is called the bride of Christ. You need to see yourselves as God sees you. You might feel you're forsaken. You're not. You might feel that you're desolate. You're saying, I got nothing left, God. I got nothing left. God doesn't see you that way. You are his delight. He's not saying, oh, man, I, waited. I leaned on you again. You fell again and you broke again. You're his delight. How amazing is that? And I still believe in you. I'm still going to build you up. I'm still going to be praying for you. Why? Because you're my delight. You're my bride. See, this seat, when we're believing him, it's a seat of honor for the bride. Right by our groom. Saying, look how much I love you. Look how much I care for you. That I set this spot specifically for you. No matter how you feel about your past, or even stuff you might have even done now in the present. Know that God loves you, cares for you, and how he sees you. His belief in you is so amazing that he gave his all. Believe in the one who believes in you. Amen. So we take the bread. It's that element in our hands. Sorry, I'm so used to doing it from the top. <laughs> Let's take that element. I pray that we take communion differently today. Knowing that belief is so much more than mental. See, Jesus had his body broken to fix the relationship between God and man. Because on our own, we were like the old Adam. We were arrogant. It's who we were. But he gave his all so we could see the newness that he has for us. So the Bible says that his body was broken for us. So he can heal us. Let us pray. God, we thank you so much for what this represents. God, your body broken. But God, you did it to fix the relationship between us and you. I pray as we take this, that we would think, be reminded about what it said in Isaiah 22. That with those nails, you lifted up even the lowliest of things. We might feel like a small city like Philadelphia, like something that's in, in, just, just so insignificant. Because of all the different shakes and tremors in our life. But Jesus, you see us and you say, I delight in you. Your word says, but for the joy you endured the cross. The joy set before you. God, we thank you that you had great joy thinking of that relationship with us. God, we pray that you would strengthen us. We have little strength. God, we pray you would strengthen us, that we would be reminded that, God, you lift us up. You give us the strength that we need. We can trust fully in you. We thank you so much. Let's take this together. The Bible says he took the cup and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. See, Jesus gave his blood to give us the opportunity to be free from sin. To have that new name. To be totally new in him. That's why he gave his blood up for us. So we have the opportunity to take advantage of that new name. So Jesus, we thank you so much for what this represents. God, you gave us new opportunities. Your blood cleanses us from our old name, from our old reputation. God, as we've talked about before, the name in the Bible, a person's name was their reputation. But Jesus, your blood gives us a new reputation. We're not long, no longer our old life. We're not lo no longer somebody who's continuously doing a sin or anything else like that. God, we are brand new in you. 
God, it's not arrogant to say that we're the ones that you delight in because your word says that. That's not arrogance. It's accepting how you see us. God, I pray that our delight would match yours, that we would delight in you. God, I pray that we would see that you see us as your bride, the one you gave everything for, you gave your life for. God, I pray that we would see that as our new definition because of your blood. That is our new name. We would walk, God, as the, the verse said there in Revelation 3, victorious because of your blood. Thank you so much for what this represents. Let's take this together. God, we thank you as we're closing out today. God, help us not just to have information, help us to have transformation. Let us look at these verses again throughout the week. May we be blown away by Isaiah 22, by seeing that you lifting up even the lowliest of things. God, that you open doors and no one can shut, that you shut doors and no one can open. God, we could talk about these verses for days. I pray you would speak to us right where we're at. God, I pray that we would look also in Romans 11 to be encouraged that no one is too far gone. God, that you still believe in unbelievers. You still want to reach out to them. God, and we know it's hard for us to hear at times that we are missionaries called to reach out to others, but I pray that we would embrace that. Because God, what we're doing, we're like a bride bragging on her husband. You got to know who Jesus is for yourself. Don't just hear about Jesus. Don't just say, oh, my, my mother was a Christian, and my dad was a Christian, my grandmother was a believer. God, help us to reach out to people, allow them to understand ethnicity is not enough. Our background is not enough. Our cultural background is not enough. We need to make that decision. Allow us to have the understanding, the right words to say to speak this to other people's lives. You grafted us in to help us, to heal us, but also reach out to way more people than we could ever possibly imagine. Help us to follow as you lead. Thank you for all that you're doing in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. I want to encourage you as we're closing. We're going to have uh, those who are getting baptized are going to go ahead and get changed right now. Uh, but I want to encourage you, if you like, we'd love for you to stay. That's why we have these name tags so people can actually get to know who you are. So try to sit by somebody you don't know. That's a good thing. And you don't have to just pretend to say, hi, you. You can actually say their name now. That's a good thing. Uh, so I want to encourage you on that. Uh, I also want to encourage you to stay there for the food. Uh, it's going to be a great time. If you didn't get anything, that's okay. We have people who brought things. We want to run the jewel or, lot, you know, anything else like that. Go ahead, whatever. But don't think you have to. It's perfectly fine. God bless you. And uh, go out there. We'd love to see you in just a second. We're going to be setting up. Uh, the baptism is going to be right across. And if we can get some people to help out, uh, to bring out some uh, couple additional tables and chairs, that'd be awesome as well. God bless. Remember tomorrow, prayer in the park, 7 o'clock.